We're back here at the Kennedy Space Center, and uh, if you look very closely, peering through the haze there, you can see the SS Scandinavian Sea, which is a cruise ship that left uh, Port Canaveral at 8 o'clock this morning, and here is a shot from on uh, deck of the Scandinavian Sea. It's uh, sort of a cruise to nowhere. They uh, went out for the liftoff and 12 hours of uh, dining, drinking, dancing, and uh, space watching. Maybe even uh, some gambling. There probably are slot machines uh, on the sea, uh, on the boat. Here is uh, former Senator George McGovern, who has come down to uh, see the launch of the shuttle today. I think it's interesting to see, Frank, how many young people, like we saw Amy Carter, yes. typically 14 years old, grew up in a time when uh, when man, she never knew when man didn't go to the moon. That's right. We see the, the young people, the experiments on the getaway package. Uh, uh, young people are excited. You know, that's tomorrow, that's the future, and it's just great to see people out there excited about something that belongs to them. Well, I think in many classrooms around the country today, uh, Gene, uh, classes are being suspended while uh, the youngsters have an opportunity to watch this thing go, and I certainly hope that's the case anyway. We are in the uh, second hold now. The countdown clock has stopped. We are actually about uh, 16 minutes or so away from the moment of launch. The launch is scheduled for 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Gee, what a sight it is. Well, we can now see that, uh, I guess we call it rust and orange colored tank, as you say, it, uh, yes. it's the natural color of the insulation, primarily to save weight. Uh, they did not paint it. I believe from now on they will mix it uh, with a white pigment, so it'll, it'll be white again. This may be the only launch we see it this way. Well, they uh, not only did not paint it, uh, but they saved weight, and they saved a few dollars, too. And this is a time to do that. Yes, that should make uh, David Stockman and his uh, crew happy. Well, the uh, Space Shuttle Columbia is going off on its third mission, but it has been uh, spruced up and uh, polished, you might say, and made ready for this uh, third mission. It started uh, right away. Here's Jules Bergman with a report on what they did to get it ready. Preparations for Columbia's third flight began as soon as it landed last November. After the initial safing and inspection, the shuttle's payload and fuel tanks were removed. Ten days later, the orbiter was ferried back to the Kennedy Space Center, piggyback on its 747. First stop there, the orbiter processing facility. The heat tiles were checked for damage, and about 450 were replaced. There are 32,000 tiles, and all were rewaterproofed. The remote arm was serviced, and a new end effector used for grasping the payloads was installed. The fuel cell that failed during the second mission, cutting short that flight, was replaced and the other two fuel cells carefully checked. Also replaced was the auxiliary power unit, or APU, that overheated during the second shuttle's first launch attempt, causing the scrub at T-31 seconds. Nine scientific experiments were loaded into the cargo bay. Other experiments were placed in the crew compartments. Then the Columbia was moved to the huge vehicle assembly building. Here, the solid fuel rocket boosters and the external tank holding the main engine's liquid fuel were mated on the mobile launcher. Finally, the orbiter was lifted off the ground with its landing gear retracted to be joined with the rest of the shuttle. The shuttle rollout to the pad on the massive crawler took about seven hours. Between the second and third flights, four months elapsed, half as long as it took between flights one and two, and moving toward NASA's goal of a one-month turnaround time between missions. Well, they're getting there. They're moving a little closer and cutting down that turnaround time, Gene. Well, you know, realistically, uh, and perhaps unrealistically, at, at a time in the future, we're planning to launch 24 of these vehicles in one year. Yes. That's, uh, that's very optimistic. I'm not sure we'll ever attain that, but I think you have to have some goals, some rules from which to work from. Well, of course, the thing has to uh, go up and down frequently, too. Otherwise, it doesn't really fulfill its mission because it's supposed to be a sort of a uh, very, very glamorous pickup truck to take things up there and uh, retrieve them and bring them back down. And if it does it only a few times a year, then uh, the shuttle will not really have achieved its objective. Well, and co it, its cost effectiveness is, in fact, dependent upon how much it flies. And, of course, somewhere idea. down the line, there ought to be a large laboratory for uh, it to have a destination to go to. And this is what's coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are a few minutes away from picking up the countdown. The clock has been stopped uh, at the nine-minute mark and it will pick up again with nine minutes to go in just a few minutes. Our coverage of Space Shuttle Columbia will continue in a moment. Yes, 
We're back here at the Kennedy Space Center. The man you see there with the Admiral's cap is William Webster, the director of the FBI. This may be his uh, first viewing of a uh, missile uh, or of a uh, shuttle launch. The uh, weather is uh, really kind of, I don't know, uncertain, it seems to me. Uh, Frank, Gene. we're getting that cloud cover move in again. Yeah. It, uh, you know, it's quite possible it'll move in and move out all day long. But now, at this point in time, it seems to be g getting clouded over uh, with much more dense coverage than it had a little earlier. We may get a report very soon, though, from uh, Gene, uh, or from uh, John Young, uh, who's been up in the uh, weather plane uh, scouting around to see whether that uh, runway here at the Kennedy Space Center uh, would be clear and would be visible if they uh, wanted to uh, or had to uh, make a return. Lynn Schur is out here just in front of the uh, countdown clock. We are at the point, of course, where people begin to wonder whether anything else could uh, possibly go wrong because we're getting very close to where things are just supposed to move right along smoothly to the magic moment of liftoff. But, Lynn, you can recall uh, some times when we've been almost there and had to stop. Absolutely, Frank. This is exactly the critical time when the last two space shuttles ran into trouble. Columbia's maiden voyage, as you remember, last April, was delayed just 20 minutes before launch. It was that planned 10-minute hold that we've already gone through. And as you recall, the onboard, uh, onboard computers just refused to talk to one another. So the launch was scrubbed that day. It turned out that the computers were just a little bit out of sync. And the shuttle got off perfectly all right two days later. STS-2 came even closer to liftoff before another computer problem held it earthbound. As you remember very well, that was T-minus 31 seconds, tantalizingly close to the launch. And at that time, the pressure started to fall in an oxygen tank. Well, the humans in the control room here decided it was okay, but they didn't decide that fast enough. The computers got there first. They shut down the clock at T-minus 31 seconds. Uh, that time, of course, it took eight days before Columbia could launch again. Right now, we have absolutely no indication that that will happen again. Uh, All right, Frank. Frank. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Here's the uh, voice of launch control. Holding. At the present time, launch director George Page is telling the commander Well, we're waiting to see what he's telling the commander. This is shuttle launch control, T minus nine minutes. We are preparing to come out of the countdown. We have just been given a go by launch director George Page. He just talked to the crew and said that he was sorry about the one hour delay, but wished them uh, a good launch. The Commander Jack Lausma said that he appreciated the fact that they have the hopes and the prayers of the American people with them on this launch, about one minute away from coming out of the countdown. Following ignition of the solid motors and liftoff of the vehicle at 11 o'clock, the vehicle will take approximately seven seconds to clear the tower. At that point, the shuttle velocity will be greater than 100 feet per second and increasing. When the velocity reaches 121 feet per second, the vehicle will begin to pitch over, followed by a roll maneuver to align it properly with the flight azimuth. At 44 seconds into the flight, the vehicle will encounter the greatest structural loads on it, and the crew will reduce the main engine thrust to 72%. At 1 minute and 3 seconds, the vehicle is through the max Q area, and the crew will increase the thrust back to 100%. 10 seconds away from picking up the countdown. During this hold, the launch team was briefed on the way in which a halt can be called. And we're at T minus nine minutes and counting. The launch events are now being controlled by the ground launch sequencer from now up to T minus 25 seconds when they switch to the onboard redundant set launch sequencer. The ground launch sequencer is part of the launch processing system and operates by relaying commands to the computers on board computers, which they then report back to the launch processing system that the commands have been executed. The primary job of the computers is to check that all of the launch commit criteria, such as propellant loads, temperatures, pressures, and other measurements are proper. The launch and recovery director has ordered the chase planes to take off. We're coming up on the eight-minute point in the countdown. PLD, 
Frank, if we see the people come alive, you can almost see Columbia come alive here. Everything proceeding smoothly.